Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I put this talk together internally because what I, I found was talking with customers and, and um, other, other agencies, it, it seemed there was a bit of confusion around what SRE is. And it reminded me back when DevOps was becoming this thing where there's lots of confusion, like what is DevOps? Uh, and then I, I feel we're in that same position uh, with SRE. So I, I did this talk internally and we invited some customers along as well. Uh, and I think Dylan saw it and thought it might be good to, to launch this particular SRE. So my viewpoint is going to come from one of practicality. Uh, so while I was working at CBA, setting up, trying to set up an SRE capability and failed and then tried again and tried a different path. So I'm going to share around some concepts of SRE, but I really want to take it home how it fits into a working environment in the enterprise uh, and also too, like why it's so successful and, and um and I hope I do a good job of it because I know some of the people from Google are, are, are logged on and watching as well. So I'm sure at the end they're going to hold me to task if I misrepresent anything there. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? We can. We can. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk around what the hell is SRE? So again, some agenda. So I'm just going to go a bit into site reliability engineering and talk a bit around the hierarchy of needs. Uh, and then I, I wanted to find reliability because I think that's a, a key aspect. Because without that, you can't have things like observability. And talk a bit about this. It's, it's a real, a lot of people come around the concept of error budget, but hopefully I can bring a bit of a slant on it and introductory, like why it's important and how to go about it. And then a bit of a wrap up at the end. So I think everyone knows, if you've read a bit about SRE or Google online, this is pretty much one of the top quotes that come through. So I want to read it out because there's a key element here. So fundamentally, site reliability engineering is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations function. And, and I think this is the key aspect I want to drill on, and I'm going to go into a bit of depth today, is that a lot of people just focus on the software engineering part, but don't taken necessarily thing around the operations function. And, and again, when you think around DevOps and how it came to be, it, it was really around to stop throwing things over the fence because why? It, 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 you're building an asset. If you're building so, a platform or services or software, it, it's really a, a, a reusable asset. So you, if you invest in six months in building something or a couple of months in building something, it's probably going to run for years. So you want to make sure that that, that operation it's built for run is, is taken care of. So again, I think that's an important part to think about when we talk around the SRE journey. Let's talk a bit about traditional operations. So look, I think a lot of us have familiarity with this uh, in the operations world and traditional, we hear terms like ITIL, uh, like service management. Uh, their KPIs are very different. They're, they're, they're measured, it's really about availability, but they carry around downtime and, and they see downtime as the exception. So it should never happen. And this is why we have these big heavy governance change boards, and review of, of, of services, but also too, it leads to over-provisioning and, and really costly expenditure to make sure your platform is highly available. And really, that's not the way you want to look at it. And then this is what I love about site reliability engineering because it, it treats software that you're gonna, a failure is inevitable. So I don't care how good a coder you are, there will be bugs. Uh, and, and, and also, too, it's not just the bugs you've got to worry about. You've got to worry about the aftertree of your system. So environments change. There's patching. That 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 that, that payload or workload you, you're working on, that underneath platform will change. SRE takes that into account because what you're really doing is looking around like, how am I going to uh, respond to when an inevitable failure comes around? And this is where this key aspect of observ observability comes, okay? And that's a key bit because there's, Usually what happens is you, you in old systems, you know it's down because the customer's ringing you or the internal stakeholder's ringing you. We want to get to a point where you're monitoring, you're alerting, uh, you're, you're actually heading before time and, and using things like anomaly detection so that you sort of get to know before things are likely to fail. So let's talk a bit about the hierarchy of needs. And what do we mean by that? So Mikey here has put together, this is it's very similar to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're familiar with that, like, like, like food and shelter is down the bottom and once you get that sustainability at the top is altruism. Here he breaks it down into uh, these particular components. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through each one, but I'm going to really focus around these particular key elements. The top two starts with the customer. It's really, really important. This is around your product and development. 
Uh, and again, why site reliability, reliability engineering is so key is because you want to maintain that, that, that level of service and consistency. How does that come about? Well, when you look in the middle layer, that really, this is where the software element comes through. You want to make sure that the, solid, the software is high quality, but also too, you want to make sure that you've got those testing and release procedures in place. So when we test things, like it's not just testing your code and testing your platform. You want to, you actually want to test your deployment process too. And a key aspect of that is having those metrics along the way, so you can actually do root cause analysis and post mortem to figure out what goes wrong. Now, to me, a key element, and I'm really, I, I think, what I went from a software engineering background uh, into lots of environment management, and and then into lots of automation. But my last role really opened me up to the, the real world of operations. So uh, before Scantino, I, I managed all the big data platforms and advanced analytics platforms for CBA. So it, it's huge, right? So basically, like you're talking about a third of the economy in transactions and half the population of Australia's customers. And when those systems go down, like it's not fun. Like you do not want to be in the paper for those wrong reasons. And what I learned very, very quickly is uh, observability and monitoring is, is, is key here. It's readiness against failure. Uh, and then again, when you have huge amounts of system, and I, and I guess this is where Google got it right because where what Google had the challenge with is how do you do things at scale? And this is an important area. So they're looking at mass services like of millions of concurrent users. How do you do scale? You, you, you can't take the, 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 the traditional ops point of view. You need to be thinking around monitoring as an extension of your testing. Uh, so that when you need to know before the system, before users know if there's a, a, an incident you need a response to it as well. And it's readiness against failure because as we mentioned before, inevitability of failure, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to happen. So let's define reliability. So again, it's all about keeping the customer happy. So we, want, we really want to make sure that our customers engage with our, our, our product. And, and even if you're not delivering a, a customer facing product, you'll be developing uh, something that does face to a customer. So even it's internal stakeholders, those particular stakeholders may uh, have an end customer in mind. This is how we normally typically do it in, in the enterprise world. Uh, those who have an operational background or worked in like, a, like large corporations, probably familiar with these, they're called service level agreements. And traditionally it was a, it was a document that you made where it's literally like a, a legal contract uh, that you'd put in place as a service provider, that's my customer, that I agree with this amount of uptime, and, and basically if an incident happens, this is going to be my response time uh, to respond and then also to response time to get that service restored. Lengthy documents, uh, and, and, and anyone who's an engineer here knows, as soon as you write something down, the document becomes obsolete within weeks. But there's a better way. And this is where we're going to start going some of the buzzword bingos uh, that uh, SRE give us, so such as terms as SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. So I'm going to break these down a little bit. And so hopefully, because something I find that when you read the, if you read the SRE workbook um, or handbook as well, uh, and I think a lot of people have this expectation, I'm going to read the handbook and go implement it. I think you need to have a bit of understanding around how does that translate in, in, into the real world. If you're doing greenfields, probably a lot easier. When you try to retrofit SRE operating models into existing uh, platforms with, with uh, enterprise teams, you need a bit of upskill. This, this translation, I think, is really, really important. Um, sorry, I'm going to... Yeah. Sorry, I just lost my slide then. So the service level agreement, as I mentioned before, is, it's really your interface into the business, but you, you want to work backwards from that. And that, that's the key area. Really, what you want to be focusing on is your service level objective. So and the way I define a service level objective is, this is how you measure performance. And I'm going to go some uh, some examples a bit later on, but I'll, I'll give you a bit of definition, definition now. It's how you measure performance. And in order to measure performance, well then you need to actually understand what, what, what are the, what's the telemetry and instrumentation I need to actually get, collect that data to, to, to test whether my measurement of performance is meeting it. And once you can understand that and you have that observability, then you can actually engage with the customer on the SLA. No point making an SLA an agreement that you're never going to meet or, or is going to fail a, a lot of the time. You're just setting yourself up for failure. This is where getting that monitoring um, in place uh, and understanding what is capable on the service uh, to set those service level objectives it is absolutely key. So let's go into some of what these these indicators are. 
Uh, and if you read a lot of the the, the handbooks in there, uh, they talk around four golden signals. And this is a good this is a good starting place. There's much more than that. Uh, and and again, um, this mainly focuses on the application payload. Uh, I, I'm actually going to bring uh, some probably some other elements that I bought. I did in a, a previous webinar where I was really focusing on the data element because again, you can actually use these same set of principles SRE in the data world. So let's go through the first four. First one's latency. Obviously, uh, that's a, a key indicator for, for lag. Uh, throughput, so again, is your pipeline fat enough to, to uh, handle all those particular requests coming through? Saturation and errors. So I'm not going to get lots of detail on these because I think that they, they're a topic on, on, on their own and there's lots of documentation here. I want to focus on how we translate that and, and make them usable. So let's bring that back to our service level, level indicators. So there's some common things you need to think about when we're, we're going to define them. As we mentioned before, these are the things that you're actually going to measure and monitor for you to define what a performance measurement is, and that's gonna be your objective. So availability. And this is a hot topic because uh, availability um, is, is something that's probably translated a bit different in the data world as opposed to the platform world or application world. So it's pretty key. Everyone talks about the, the, the two nines, the three nines, the four nines. Latency. So again, we, we discussed it earlier, but how long does that service take to respond? And as, as sometimes, and why it's key to understand what the customer um, is expecting for these is sometimes latency is not an issue. Sometimes you, you can wait a few seconds for a reply. It could be send and forget. Uh, but sometimes it, it, it's key if you're talking about user interface, well, then you want to make it snappy. You want to keep that customer engaged. Throughput, how many requests can uh, be handled at the same time? So again, this is really, really important as well. And yield. So how many responses from the service return correctly? So, and again, you really need to understand the requirement uh, of what the customer is looking for with, with, with your particular service. And that will define which ones of these you want, you want to focus on and what, what your tolerance and variance is going to be in those areas. So some, uh, some further examples as well around things to monitor as well. Um, so you might measure like uh, like a 200 response, like was it successful? But you may want to dig deeper in that depending on the, the type of application. Um, so again, you may, I, I won't go through all of these, um, but again, you want to look like throughput, how many successful transactions before receiving 500s? So it, it really is not one size fits all. You need to really think around what it is you want to produce. So again, service level objectives, to break it down, there are agreements between engineering and product and the business on service availability. So going back to what I stressed before, there's not one size fits all. You have to understand what it is that's going to keep the customer happy and then work backwards from that to work and then define what are my um, SLIs going to be. Um, I, I remember hearing some people say, like, monitor all the things. Well, I, I did totally disagree with that because... Uh, once you start getting scale, you just create noise. You want to measure the right thing. You're better off starting with the key elements. Uh, and then when you do get a failure, and this is where the automation comes in. If you have a failure of a good continuous delivery pipeline, you can respond to that. Your, your medium time response speeds up. Then if you miss something in testing, what's well, something you probably need to add into your monitoring? Because monitoring to me is an extension of testing. And that, that again, that's going to dictate what service level indicators you need to maintain the type of objective that you want to keep for your customer. I'm hearing a lot of bings. Should I have a look into the chat here? Okay, good. So some examples of, um, of, of some of these metrics. So if you look at service to a metric, we had availability before. Remember we talked around response 200 for a particular crest. Well, this is when you, you wrap those particular SLIs up. What does it mean? Well. I, I want to use these to dictate that I want availability of 95% of services yearly uh, for latency. So again, so my downstream request should respond within 300 seconds. So again, looking around the types of responses you want to get, you want to aggregate that up into a, a performance measurement. This is how I want to measure my, my service as well. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the data world, you could look at batch jobs. So 
how many batch jobs is going you going to need to have that required throughput to get data to populate your data lake for data lake for advanced analytics or data warehouse for um, some some type of reporting. Oh, sorry, I'm Let's talk about data a little bit. This is a quite interesting one. So um, this is where I really focused. Uh, in my experience with SRE is in the data space. So it's a bit different because none of the, no, no handbooks were talking around data. They were just talking around platform and applications. Uh, so when I started talking around these types of uh, like uh, indicators and, and acronyms with the, the teams I was working with, they were saying, what the hell are you talking about? Like we don't get, it's, this is data that's not service. So when I, I took that as a disagreement. So I started mapping out some examples to explain to the team and, and to all my customers, some, some of my customers as well, uh, around the services where we need to build and to do. I said, well, you actually got service attributes on your data. Uh, and, and I gave an example, like like obviously working in the bank, like there's a, a huge push for uh, anti-money laundering reports. Now they need to be accurate. Now in the data world, your data needs to be accurate, timely and complete. So there's some aspects around how, how do you measure that? How do you want to make sure uh, from an SRE site reliability uh, engineering point of view, when you have a team that's going to manage this, um, what 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 are they going to? What's their observability metrics? And what are they going to focus on? Well, one is like fresh data. No point having data that's not consistent and might be a couple of weeks old. Well, that's that's going to give you the wrong data values at the end when you do your your translation. Completeness. Well, I want to measure to make sure that 100% of my streams loaded or the the 90% that I'm needed to generate this particular report have loaded as well. I want to know that. I want to make sure my monitoring observability picks that up and I want to make sure my engineering team understands that because they need to code that into the data pipeline as well. Things like data accuracy. So you want to look at things like statistical profiling. So again, so if you're doing data translations, you want to make sure that uh, when you're doing some calculations, you, there's a rounding error, but you want to make sure like the rounding errors in thousands of dollars and not hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have seen rounding errors of millions of dollars, by the way, but we won't talk about that. Uh, and data breaches as well. So again, there's, it, 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 again, I think when you look at the SRE landscape, when you define uh, measurements of your service, don't forget compliance and security. These are things you want to measure as well. You want to, who, who's getting access to your data? And this is the area I know that data uh, that Google do really, really well. Obviously, being a data company internally, they've they've got full visibility of um, of access of, of their own internal data. So, and this is a big key part around developing an SRE practice. Uh, in traditional ops, the, those types of agreements and SLAs were generally arbitrary numbers based upon rudimentary data sets. What I like to think what SRE gives you is when you have that observability, you're using data to make informed decisions. And it needs to be agreed, but not just from your project manager, but engineering needs to be at the table there because they're supplying the data of what's acceptable and ultimately the customer who's going to sign off on this. So let's talk a bit about the error budget. So um, I'm going to try to simplify this as well because I, I must admit when I, I, I kind of got it when I first read it, but when you start to put it in place, it's not as it's actually not as easy as it seems. Uh, if you do simple ones, sure. Um, I think uh, in Greenfields, in a new organization, it could be, and, uh, and I'll go through some of the complexities you, you, you'll you get when you try to implement uh, an error budget in an existing organization. So what is it? It's really the difference between when you when you set that service level objective, that performance measure, uh, and then you don't meet that, okay, or, or your measurement, it's the gap. So if you're within your error, error budget means that pretty much what you've measured is within that objective that you set with a customer and if it goes over that well then you're exceeding your error budget so these the the technical um equation for this and again they're using uh on availability here uh, but it's 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 really a quantitative approach not just uh qualitative and that's 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 the big difference as well you want to use data to make a decision around whether uh you need to slow down the types of uh, changes you need to do and, and and focus on like hardening sprints or something. Uh, and let me unpack that a little bit, but I probably didn't explain it the right way. And the outcome for an error budget is you really want to 
use it as a, a guide around this whole um, new functionality versus resiliency. And this is always a battle uh, that you'll get in, in, in engineering. So like you can't gold plate everything and we do have deadlines to meet and there are budgets. So that means you need to, you need to take a risk-based approach sometimes in, in, in when you're developing. Uh, and sometimes you have to cut some features out. Uh, and in reality, what happens a lot of the time is testing gets cut out. So you want to be smart around that. And this is a great way of keeping a balance in check between uh, your, 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 let's say, your alpha team that just turning out new features and, and, and pumping out and your, and, your, and your SRE team, your operations team that need to take on that particular load. In the old world, basically, this is where those that the hard SLA, like the the operations teams normally KPI'd around availability. Obviously, this was odd. Uh, operations KPI'd on availability, like uh, only so many incidents uh, per year or that had resulted to a particular downtime. Uh, and then we we KPI'd and rewarded and incentivized delivery teams the opposite, just to get change in fast. As I, that, that should be the opposite way around. Operations should help change be faster, uh, and then delivery should actually be incentivized for the least amount of, uh, of, of errors possible. So error budgets are useful in that sense because it helps you ca classify the risk ongoing. Um, so, and what I mean by that is if you can set a target for your error budget and then you can have an agreement around what is the, what's the course of action should, should, should the team or service start going over that budget, um, then you can start to look at things around, if you read the Google handbook, essentially like no more deployments, like that's it. You reach the error budget for the month. Uh, you can't do any deployments. Tr tried doing that once. Uh, that didn't last long. So I got told you have to let the chain of flow go through. Uh, and again, like in huge organizations, what you're battling against is huge programs of work, uh, which have large amounts of money, marketing put behind it. So it's it's non-trivial just to stop a particular, uh, particular deployment or it might be a compliance deadline that needs to be hit on a certain date or else you, you're going to get a fine as well. But there's other ways you can you can um, change that as well. Another way is like you, you compromise the amount of hardening sprints or percentage of res operational resilience uh, into the code once you start getting close to the meeting your, your error budgets there. Um, and that's what I put on the bottom here. So instead of stopping, you might want to prioritize stability over features as well, because that's always an option. Uh, and then if, if you work with your, your, your product owner, there's nothing stopping them if you have enough lead time up front to reset the expectation of customers. Like, look, we're getting lots of instability. Uh, we promise these features in the next couple of sprints. It's we're gonna, and that's what Agile is about. We want to we want to reprioritize that. Uh, we're going to give you a less set, but we're going to increase the stability of the service. And error budgets are a great way of working on that. And look, here's here's a particular example as well. You may want to have ones on availability. Uh, you may want to do per annum. Uh, you may want to look at ones per quarter, per week, per day. Uh, it, you can have some flexibility in that. But again, when you're defining those service metrics, your SLOs, and then you work backwards with your SLIs, you should also be thinking around um, the the error budgets. Like what, what are the important ones if we do breach these particular ones that we have a serious problem? And you, you agree that with the customer and the product owner up front. So... Again, I oh, sorry, I, I forgot I had this slide in here. This was talking around what happens when you exceed the error budget. Um, no more features being deployed. Um, if if you if you're lucky, you can get that in. Um, but probably a small organization. But I, I, what I find definitely works is focusing back on on hardening sprints. Uh, and one one thing I always advocated. Uh, in my release engineering team, I always wanted a ratio uh, of the story points that went in, uh, was something like 70% were new features, but 30% was addressing technical debt. Okay, and I think if you if you can do that from the outset, uh, you've you got a much better way of doing that. So what are some of the practices as well? Um, again, if, you, you, if you're going to go down the error budget path, you have to be, you, you, your monitoring and observability must be in place. It has to be 
uh, quantitative, can't be qualitative. It just won't work because then you're going to get back into the old change management routine where it becomes subjective and objective uh, for the meeting the outcomes, whether you're going to like put the finger in the air to give the okay for change to go through. It's not the way you want to go. You want to go on the data as well. Yeah, this is a good one as well. So if you if you if you're new to SRE, uh, there's a huge uh, lots of conversation around toil. What 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 is toil? It's something that uh, I, I managed to get into our vernacular uh, where I was working as well. Uh, and basically, and, and a good part of this is if you're actually spending more time fixing than building, then you. It's a good chance that your error budget is, is definitely being exceeded, or you, don't want, or you need to get one in place. Uh, if you look at the handbook, they say typical SRE it should be like fifty percent, like a build uh, development, and fifty percent operations. Uh, look, my my rule is that if you're starting new, great, but if you've got an existing crew, you really got to look around how much technical debt, how many incidents you have going on at the time. Um, but you definitely need to draw a line in the sand because if you don't carve out for that that team to spend around fixing technical debt um, you'll never get that part down so you, you may start off with like uh, an 80 20 where it's 80 percent fixing operation issues and 20 percent uh, of um, like automation and, um, or it might be 70 percent uh, if, if it's not so bad but, you, but and likewise, you also need to ensure that you're carving off that team to do the automation because if they don't focus on the automation, they'll never be able to get out of that mindset where they're constantly responding manually to items. Uh, and then and before automation, sorry, that you, need, you need to be focusing on the observability and monitoring first, then the automation. So wrapping up. So, so SREs, who are they? They're, they're software engineers who specialize in reliability. I'm gonna read the whole quote out. You, you, you can read that there, but it's important to note that they do specialize in reliability. And again, another key failing of understanding is they're not just plain software engineers. Um, I, I've worked with some amazing engineers who they wouldn't probably consider themselves SRE, but they're just, they're, they were basically systems administrators who could code really, really well. Uh, and then when we threw them at like really wicked complex problems, like like basically we, we had a team, a couple of guys, um, and there was a networking issue. They went down to the Pakalay to inspect it. Uh, and then like I won't say that there was a vendor looking after that part in, in the organization and spent years saying, no, there's no problem. Uh, this team took about two weeks to identify and graphed out what the actual problems were, what the source was, uh, and availability uh, went up like overnight when, when we got that fixed and be able to ge generate that, that particular report. So they're a special type. I think if you want to be good at an SRE, uh, you need to be thinking around reliability um, and have, have the mindset around not just coding some, some, some I don't know, some, some, some functions uh, or some, some, some Docker images with an app running inside it, but how, how is that going to interact with the platform, interact with other apps and if it's a data space, how is your data stream going to impact potentially downstream systems as well? You need to be thinking around that because it's all around distributed systems. And when you work in large complex uh, arenas, uh, change happens a lot and then issues are inevitable and failure will happen. Um, yeah, so Tammy's from Gremlin. I have not used the Gremlin tool. I'm, I'm, I'm very keen to have a bit of a demo and have a play around with that because it leads me on to um, one of my next slides. So what is it all about? So it's about preparing and minimizing failure and maximizing awesome. So we put this slide in. So again, if you're new to SRE, what, what skills do you need? I think this is, look, this is my personal view. I haven't got this from, from Google. Um, I think systems engineering experience for infrastructure performance is, is really key. Um, I say, look, I, I always usually give a language warning. Whenever I say IT, people start switching off straight away. Um, I think understand, you don't have to like be a practitioner of, of IT in the old way, but having understanding is, I think is really important because once you have an understanding, it's actually there to design and be there to get you thinking around 
uh, incidents, response to incidents, uh, what constitutes a problem. So, so basically, what do you want to fix and how do you prioritize that as well? Uh, and, and as well as around how do you build things, how do you design things that, that are built to run? There's a great book called The Art of Monitoring. Uh, I, I highly recommend reading that particular one. Uh, they're not wedded in the tool sets, but it gives you some good ideas around how to quickly set up an environment where you've got some good monitoring and alerting capability as well. And you do need to understand some software engineering practices. Okay. And why I say that is, excuse me, is when you think around application support um, performance and how you want to codify uh, and, and, and put some automation. Um, I, I had some teams and, and unfortunately I didn't invest in the time and I wasn't on top of what they were doing. Uh, and they, they just got, I'm going to automate, I'm going to script. And then I, they came back later with a whole bunch of bash scripts. I'm like, oh, that, nice, good, step in the right direction, but you, you can't tokenize that. I much prefer they use Python or something like that. So again, that that reusable uh, IP within there, it's, it's, it's key, I think, to have some level of software engineering talent in there. Now, to be really awesome and level up, uh, this is where you really want to stand resiliency engineering. So you've got reliability engineering, okay, and that's, that's covered off. If you, My personal opinion is if you want to go next level and be truly awesome, understand resiliency engineering. People call it chaos engineering, but resiliency engineering has actually been around for, for quite some time. And if you've worked with a resiliency engineer, they're different level. Like I, Again, uh, a good friend of mine still works at CBA, like he 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 reads network traffic and he can tell me exactly what the app's doing, what's happening, like to that to that level. Uh, and another good area for for learning is I, I look at Netflix a lot. I, I kind of I feel they're amazing at this area of chaos engineering. Like you look at even where they do their software defined networks, like they're literally able to. Uh, they, I think they modify like the the TCP header. So in there, it denotes whether it's test traffic and production traffic, which enables them to do some types of testing in production without uh, affecting um, uh, production payloads. Uh, they've gone beyond uh, Chaos Monkey, and they've got Chaos Gorilla, so they, they unplug whole sections of the, the network, uh, and, and it's resilient, it stays up, because why? They've designed it that it will fail, and that's a key area as well. I feel like I'm losing my voice, sorry, I've been talking all day. So look, just want to say thank you uh, for listening in. Uh, I'll probably open it up to some questions now. Hi, Michael. It's Tom here. And um, we've got about 12 questions so far. So if you don't mind, I'm going to fire them at you and then you yeah, can talk sure. to the guys. Yeah. Um, so Jessica's first question is, if teams in a business don't play a value, place a value on reliability, how do you approach implementing SRE principles without being a force of unwanted change? Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's actually good, and you will get that a lot because they don't care about that. I think what the, one, one approach which always works: never waste a crisis. So what you want to do is have this prepared. If I'm, I'm sure there'll be somewhere in your work where did you ever get like a failure or some, some downtime or some particular system that's critical. That's when you want to you you want to raise it. Uh, the sense of uh, risk or impending risk, uh, and raise risks as well. So risks are your friends. So if you're working in an organisation, especially if you've got a risk team, you you want to if you if you're familiar with something going down, uh, you want to raise a risk and and then what the impact is going to be. That is a good way of getting the attention of a risk team that will basically come parallel to your, your your manager and go top down you always want to go top down on that it, it, it is tough you, it's it's um if you don't have that how else would you do it um yeah i think the other area is this is again i got this from a guy i know worked at splunk um and what they did was when there was issues they actually calculated the downtime into dollars so again, it's collecting the facts. So rather than saying that this system was down for, I don't know, X amount of hours per year, calculate that to the impact of dollars. Uh, and, and, and you don't just do this in your production environment. Think around your test environment. So a lot of people, they say, oh, non-prod, don't worry about non-prod. It's actually really important because when a test environment goes down, you usually got like a whole team of people. Like if, if that's down for a day, just calculate the daily rate. Like a good rule of thumb is uh, like 
the cost of project usually thousand dollars a day per resource. So if you got ten people not able to work one day, well, that's ten grand. Uh, you start soon. You can see yeah. where I'm going with this. Use data to convert that into dollar value and, and create the sense of urgency. Okay, cool. Uh, Gabe has asked what good resources, books, podcasts there are out there to to learn about SRE. Obviously, other than Google's, but yeah. Look, I, I, I mentioned before, I. I, I, I've, if you really want to, like, I think next level up is read that in conjunction with the Netflix blog. It's like, oh, Google stuff's great as well. Hey, Lucas, how are you going? I hope you're still on. Uh, the, the Google stuff's really good, uh, of, of course. Uh, they, you know what a good one is? Their, their workbook that released. So it's from O'Reilly. Uh, there's the handbook and then there's the workbook. The workbook's really in-depth. It's like, I think it's like 300-odd pages or something like that. Gave some good examples. Um, and then work backwards from that. I, I, I think that um, there's yeah, I'm just what else. Yeah, I, I do that in combination with Netflix blog, um, and then yeah, and then I'll probably follow some good uh, articles on, on, on Medium. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, Lim Yandy's asked, "What does it mean to have ninety five percent availability for all services yearly?" Uh, look, that was, that was just an example. I mean, it, again, goes down to a lot of people think you have to have 99.9% uh, of, of services. You know, I should change this slide. It shouldn't be all services. It should be of a service yearly. Uh, and, and, and again, so you, you it really depends upon the service. So as I mentioned before, some of these you want to measure on a daily basis uh, or a weekly basis. Um, that was, that was just, an, just an example. I, I, I want to show that not everything needs to be 99 or well, needs to be like three nines or four nines the entire time. Um, yeah, you, know, you, have got some services that like I, I've managed some services that they only run once a year, like for ATO. So, but, but for that, oh, sorry, yeah, more than once, but for that one week that had to be available for that whole uh, life cycle and as a, a report and service, but it was quite complicated for the rest of the time, didn't care if it was down. Like we we wanted to make sure it was up, but like, what did I care about it? No, it was only that, it was only that one area. Okay. Uh, Cornet's asked what balance should be given between external monitoring and building telemetry into the product. Oh, I always believe internal telemetry is really really important. Like, so the thing is, you want to pump it out. That, Maybe, you know, when to monitor things, they're the things you want to have on from the outset because you, you're coding it, so you want to put it out. Whether you choose to ingest it, you, you've got that choice. But if you don't, put that telemetry out from the start. Uh, and then hopefully using you know, the debugging mode, you can sort of like, it should be a config change. You should be able to have config driven, um, change the amount of telemetry you want to do. But you really, my view is I, that is something that I would choose to pump out as much as possible when I think around my servers. What 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 do I want to do? There's nothing worse when your your application's a black box, um, and you, you're only getting one or two reads out of it. It's really hard to diagnose. And then obviously you got. I don't think we're there yet, but things like AI ops, you know, and the, like um, New Relic are doing a good job of this. Uh, Splunk, obviously, um, I think Sumo Logic are getting into it. Datadog, um, so that you're starting to correlate different events. Uh, and then look, and if you get some good resilience engineers, and I've seen this myself, they've been able to do this, they actually correlate particular events. But if you don't have the telemetry internally putting it out and then you're choosing to, to pick it up and ingest it and consume it, yeah, it's going to be really hard. It's both. Okay. Uh, Philip Smith, does aiming for a given metric lead to only ever achieving that metric? Um, and he gives an example as if you aim for 95% availability, do you think this precludes achieving 99 percent if not why not and shouldn't we aim for a hundred percent yeah it's a good one this we're getting get, getting into some philosophy here that's okay <laughs> I, I, I like a challenge it's good no um so you manage what you measure 100 percent. like there's no given and, and I, i've seen this like in teams where we've managed we did set to that one and it, it, it is a challenge but I think you've got to be realistic around what is achievable. Like, like 
like do you to do that it's huge costs and you, you're sort of getting back in the old traditional ops where you have to over provision and, and, and you gold plate it uh for the sake of in case it ever happens that 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 black swan event i, I much prefer to have something where it's it's satisfactory um it's going to be cheaper and faster to get to that particular point and the reason for that is because it's all about value like there's engineering, don't get me wrong, you've got to think around the customer value and the time to unlock that value. That's that's the benefit. That's why you want to do automation. That's why you do DevOps. That's why you want to ensure that you've got a good medium time to restore as quick as, quick as possible. Um, yeah, but there, there is a, probably a sweet spot in the middle. Um, but getting to 100%, I, I think that sometimes it's just not required uh, and sometimes it's just a bit too much effort as well. And because and, and, at the end of the day, it boils down to a dollar conversation around how much you want to spend to achieve that particular outcome as well. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Uh, Ranjit asks, how to make a career move to start an SRE? What would employers look for? Mm. Some, some of this will be got to do with your, 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 your background. Like for me, I, I knew when I was building a team, I was never going to get the unicorn. So when I was building a team, okay, you want to be demonstrate what you're good at. Okay, so so in my ideal team, like when you when you do it's not one team, you like you're building teams. You need to scale. You just don't have all that capability on the market. And any any recruit on the market knows like it's very hard to hire an SRE uh, lead. So what would I go for? So definitely you need software engineering experience. Okay, you you, you need that. Do you need to be expert level? No, but if you're not expert level, you better have some really good systems administration and some real exposure into operational workflows, um, preferably resiliency engineering or reliability engineering. So that, that's a particular mixture. Um, if you're really, really hot as a, a software engineer, then you just probably need to pad up, I think, like your... Uh, you, and you're probably familiar with APM, so application performance monitoring tools. You may not be in Splunk, but you might be in App Dynamics and New Relic again. So you've got some good skill sets there around the observability and telemetry. And you just probably just got to round out in your operational your skills as well. If you're pure operations, and this has been, a, I, I've probably dealt in this world the most. If you're in pure operations, you really need to uplift your 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 automation and, and coding skills, like. I'm not talking about you're learning Rust or something, but you'd better be pretty good at Python, you know, some, some, or, 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 or Golang, something that's at that that easily consumable, translatable level uh, language that you can use, sorry, uh, that is compatible like with, with platforms and infrastructure as well. Uh, and obviously, yeah, you probably, you, and you need to understand the, like uh, some, I want to say DevOps capability, but like build, CICD, build automation. Cool. Um, I'm wary of, of your time, Michael. Are you happy to answer a few more? Or? Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Um, if a business or client has an unhealthy obsession about availability at the unnecessary expense of resources, what approach do you use to convince them to adopt SRE principles? Yeah. Again, this comes down to well, a very similar question I answered before is around um, setting the sense of urgency around risk. Um, you, you will... If, if you're in, if you're going to be in an area where it's brand new features and it hasn't proved its business value to the business yet, it's, it's going to be a lot harder. If you're looking at something where it's a key critical system, uh, you're more likely to be able to establish evidence uh, of downtime impacts. Uh, down, downtime, it's, it's money. Like always, it sounds funny, but like if you really want to do change, you've got to be thinking about the money and impact. So like downtime equals dollars. Okay. Like there's no two ways. So it's, it's impact to the customer hundred percent, but it's also downtime for revenue, uh, the cost of spinning up a team to, to do that lost expense, expenditure opportunity cost. Um, there's that aspect. Sometimes like to do the, what to just focus on where there's brand damage and downtime on that. Like how, most places don't have that many events happening in a year. I, I, I think it's better to, to focus on the risk of what could happen and, and doing that whole matrix, you know, like risk, like likelihood versus impact. Just find that sweet spot in the middle, something that happens a bit, and, and build your case. Okay, cool. And final one uh, from Kavi. 
what would your recommendation for someone in data wanting to implement principles and concepts of SRE? And how different are the challenge? How different are the challenges? Yeah, um, if you Google, we did a web. So Yun, uh, a, a colleague of mine, so we did a webinar about the um, on the was it the uh, reliability is a prerequisite of innovation. So in there, I, I, I gave a, a good amount of talk around data uh, and how to implement that. Uh, that 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 one slide actually, or well, two slides actually, came from that particular presentation. Um, I you can literally use the same principles as you you would develop in the in the handbook and what Google published as well. But it all comes. What's different is it's those service performance metrics that you need to get across. And again, like looking some old school concepts, like you don't have to go far. Just look up some data basic data management uh, principles. Those data management principles, like a lot of those, defined in Dharma or DMBOK, which is kind of like data governance. But if you look at the data management area in that, it, it, it talks around quality controls of data. And then your quality control is a, a, an SLO. It's a, it's a service level objective that you want to meet with the, the customer and just work back from that and just work out uh, the SLIs. And look, I think like if you want to work in, like I'm meeting with customers and discussing that. And I'm, I'm really surprised that like data is this, Everyone is on data, but hardly any organizations are really focusing on the quality of the data. Like they realize they've got problems. There's like any, I'd say a small percentage that have figured it out. Like I, I got to speak with, um, he, he, what's his, is he the CTO or from um, Tyro? They, they've done a great job in their area around their, their, their data quality controls in, in their data pipelines. They, they, the trick is they did it as a first class citizen. So that's, that's the key. So if you want to get into data and you're like working with data engineers, like they should be thinking about this. Even if you're doing spa, like, and again, this is the things where some, the question came before around internal telemetry. But very similar for when in your data pipelines, like what 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 instrumentation are you putting out in your data pipeline that you can ingest at a later point when you need to to actually build a case story around how am I measuring the 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 quality. Uh, and the completeness and the timeliness of the data moving from A to B. Okay, cool. Um, I think that's it from question side. So if you want to pass controls over to Dale, I think he's got a few words to wrap up with. No problem. So I remember how to do this one. So to Dylan, is it? Yeah, thank you. Feel free to pass over to me or to, to, to Stephen and Mike. But um, thanks heaps for that. And um, yeah, really appreciate you taking some time. And um, we've got a number of people on the call so it's it's great to see um so many people for our <coughs> for our launch um we like i've mentioned in a couple of the messages we are we've already got a number of our next meetups organized um including a pretty interesting panel so um we'll be sharing those after this please do click a link um uh, attending um but thank you again um and i'll quickly pass it over to Stephen just to finish up If he's still with us. Questionable most of the time. Hey, there we go. <laughs> what, what an awesome talk. I hope, uh, I know that I learned um, a bucket load of stuff there because I was going to ask really dumb questions like, you know, surely um, uh, SRE is uh, obviously going to um, overtake this DevOps. It's like DevOps 2.0. So there's not going to be any more DevOps jobs, right? Isn't that right, Michael? Yeah, that's right. DevOps is dead. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> you heard it here first with a bit of... So I was gonna, um, I just have one last question for you. Um, and that is, if there was one thing that an existing sort of DevOps team could do to be able to get on the SRE journey, what would that one thing be in your opinion and your experience? Understand yeah. operations. I think that's that that's key. Like they, they do the dev in spades, the ops. I'm in my experience when I'm seeing that, I'm not seeing the operations part really, really catered for that yet. So I think if if I'm understanding correctly, by focusing more on the SRE principles, we're going to narrow the gap between the code and the customer. It's going to be far far more sort of customer centric from the word go 
which let's face it, that's what IT is supposed to do, right? It, it, it's spot on. That is that is exactly spot on. You need to focus on the customer and work backwards from the customer. I think guess what Google like put up the CRE now, you know, the customer reliability engineering. It, it, it's really f- the, 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 reducing those hand points from customer to code. Yeah. Should that be a little bit of a warning for some for some of the devs who are more sort of introverted and melancholic, and as long as they don't have to speak to anybody, then they're perfectly happy. <laughs> <laughs> What do you reckon? Yeah, I, don't know. I, I think there's always a place. I, I, I think that, I think there's always a place for them. <laughs> I think all of us have got to improve our soft skills anyway. Like if we want to be able to yeah, get on it. Uh, anyway, awesome. Thank, thank you very, very much, Michael. That was incredible. Can I just ask you one, one more question? Um, there, there are maybe some people out in the audience just now who have been thinking about doing like a. a a talk like this, you know, they, they've maybe uh, they, they've implemented a project at work. They've got some scars here, and uh, you know, they've been thinking about maybe sort of stepping up and doing, you know, doing a talk. Um, can you maybe just share, share with us how, how you felt uh, when you did your first talk, and uh, how you know what sort of steps you took to try and overcome the fear, perhaps, or to get you more into you know into the swing of things? And did it work well for you? Yeah, look, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, what I, I made sure that the content that I spoke about was something I was very familiar with. I think that's key because, like you'll notice, I didn't read off the slides. I was just ad-libbing, looked at the what the topic was uh, and really spoke from the heart. And I think that's the key element. And if you do that, if you feel comfortable in what you're presenting, your nerves will go away because you realise that's you're going to be the expert because it's your what you're presenting to. And the other thing is, uh, if you forget something, doesn't matter. Don't sweat it. They don't know. They never know that you forgot. So, so don't need to be nervous if you forgot some top points that you meant to cover and you forgot to cover. You're giving away all and my MC, Yeah. Sorry. And one, one last thing. I think uh, doing some dress rehearsals. I think that's important to. Uh, make sure that you're you're comfortable with the flow of, of the talk. And if you do that, just relax and let it happen and don't think about it. Just talk and it'll be okay. Uh, 